We are here today with Tom Campbell, Marla Fries, and Lori Houston. Thank you all for being here today. The goal of our discussion today is to step out of the realm of mystery and into the world of science to understand the communications and language our guests are familiar with receiving and interpreting every day. Let me introduce you to our guests. Tom Campbell, former NASA physicist and consciousness researcher for the past 40 years and author of My Big Toe, Big Theory of Everything, that brings together the entirety of human experience under one seamless scientific understanding. Tom is unique in that he is strongly a left brain scientist and equally strong right brain interpreter of the language of the larger reality our guests today deal with every day. Both of these strengths proved helpful in deriving a big toe. Tom's work has taken him around the world to England, Spain, Mexico, Germany, and most recently France and Portugal, where he presented his workshop to a multicultural audience. In the future, Tom will be presenting workshops at the Monroe Institute, the premier institute for research and education in the field of consciousness in the world. He is here today to share his science viewpoint and to demystify the gifts our guests use in their everyday work to help you better understand our reality from a larger picture. In Tom's words, it's the news you can use. Tom's website is mybigtoe.com. Along with Tom Camel, I'm delighted to say we have Marla Fries from Los Angeles. Marla likes to call herself an ongoing student of consciousness. Marla's work is about sharing how consciousness survives death, mediating between the living and the dead, healing, harmony, and help. Marla assists others by hearing, seeing, and feeling information pertaining to issues of the living and deceased. Marla is dedicated to building a bridge between science and people like her who can interact with the data of the larger consciousness system and to helping others understand this work and utilize their own abilities. She has said, science keeps trying to prove it, and I do that every day. Her website is marlafreeze.com. We also have with us today Laurie Houston from Toronto, one of Tom's favorite interviewers and a delightful human being. She has interviewed Tom many times as host and producer of her own radio shows. She has hosted and produced radio shows for nearly 10 years. Laurie is a professional and intuitive counselor with a Bachelor of Science degree in social work and neuro-linguistic programming. On a spiritual path for over 20 years, she has studied over 30 different healing modalities and has developed her own unique healing techniques from these. Her natural intuitive abilities and experiences have led her to the conclusion that soon we will all develop these skills as a primary mode of communication. Her website is intuitivesoul.com. Marla, we'll start with you. What would you like to accomplish today for yourself and for those you work with? How would you describe your abilities, your process, and how can Tom help? Well, thank you, Donna. Um, can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Hello? Yes. yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I like to utilize language that everybody can understand. And instead of getting stuck in certain belief systems, I think it's important to be able to utilize larger consciousness dialogue so that people have another way of looking at things. Um, as, as we've discussed before, when they hear the terminology psychic or medium, people have reactions to those words. So as Tom has taught us to talk about stepping in and tapping into the larger consciousness system. Part of the work that I do is in having the intention to communicate with deceased loved ones. Now, I have to tell you all that I didn't even believe in this work. Um, it was not something that I had any interest in. It was just something that came out of an expression, actually, um, a number of years ago. It wasn't even as a child. It was just back in the early 90s where someone said, I think that you are a medium. It was actually James von Prague. And my awareness at that time psychically was very acute. I was picking up information all over the place because I had been stalked. I was in a lot of fear. So trying to control that information and utilize that information became something that I needed help with. That's why I sought help from Lynn Buchanan with the remote viewers and Tom. It was finding a way to do something with 
with this information that I was tapping into. And what I'd like to find out today with Tom, and so that everyone else can hear about this, is when I tap into that system and I interact with it, we're, I have to learn how to control it. It's also understanding that when I tap into a consciousness that is in the system, that that, that, that consciousness of a deceased loved one has the emotional, retains the emotional frequency and information of life. And it seems to me in my experience that they continue life once they, once the physical body has died. So that's part of the reason that I work with people in bringing forth information from a deceased loved one. And I'd like for Tom to, um, to help us understand some of that. Okay. Um, I guess I could make a little bit of background uh, for our listeners. Probably all of them haven't uh, watched videos or, or read this. So I need just a little bit of background. I'll try to do it quickly so we can define some terms. And as Donna mentioned, uh, we'll start with the concept that this is a virtual reality. Now that may sound very strange to some, like that's a really big step, but it isn't anymore. Uh, most physics departments in most major universities all over this planet will have a pretty substantial number of their physicists thinking that virtual reality is the way this world works, that indeed our reality is based on information. And the experiments are driving them to that conclusion. It's not that this has just become in fashion, it's that the experiments cannot be explained in any other way other than this reality is based on information. So it's becoming the, the uh, and maybe I'll call it the next big thing in physics, but it's it's not, um, again, it's not fashionable. It's demanded by the experiments. We just had an experiment just about three or four days ago that was done for the work of John Wheeler. And, uh, you know, one more nail in that, in that uh, it's, it's all information box. You know, what he predicted, John Wheeler was a big, uh, um, he was very much in favor of this being a, an information-based reality. One of the earlier adopters of that idea and he had a, some experiments that couldn't be done because we just didn't have the equipment and the know-how how to do them. And now one of them has just been done. And sure enough, what John Wheeler said, and you've probably heard his little uh, um, soundbite that he used, and that is it from bit. It from bit means it, all of the universe, and everything comes from bits, which is information. So uh, he predicted how this particular experiment would come out based on everything being information and this being a virtual reality. They've finally been able to do that experiment, and it was just as John Wheeler said. It's information. That's the way the experiment turns out. So, so that's just one. I would say that when I, I get the emails all the time from people who find little snippets about uh, virtual reality and so on, and they send them to me, and I keep track of what's going on in science, and I would say that almost every month over the last three or four years, you will find some piece of research that can only be explained by this being a virtual reality. So starting with this idea that it's virtual reality, it's not really a wild assumption. It's pretty much the way science is looking at reality these days. All right, now, if this is a virtual reality, we can very quickly come to a, a couple of, of uh, logical consequences of that, which will help answer these questions that, that Marla has. Um, I'm going to make a little analogy with the world of Warcraft. That is a virtual reality, like The Sims. It's a, it's a video game that mostly kids play, but a lot of adults play in secret too, but uh, at least the kids <laughs> play it and admit it. Uh, one of the characters that in, that's in World of Warcraft is an elf. Okay, and it's a virtual reality and multiplayer game. That means thousands, probably tens of thousands of people from all over the world are playing in this game all at the same time. They're interacting with each other and with characters and a set that is just created by the computer itself. All right, what's going on in a virtual reality? There's only, there's only three components to virtual reality and only two of them are active. The three components are the computer that is making the virtual reality simulation, the virtual reality itself, 
and the player. That's it. There's nothing else going on in a virtual reality. Now, the virtual reality itself is just data on a hard drive. That's not active. I mean, it changes with time as, as things change, those data, the data on the hard drive gets updated, you know, maybe a hundred times a second or whatever it takes to make it look like fluid motion. It gets updated a lot, uh, but it's just data on a hard drive, packets of ones and zeros. That's it. Now, the computer, of course, that is computing this cannot be a part of the virtual reality that it's computing. A simulation cannot simulate itself. What this means is that the computer has to be outside of the reality of the elf. Okay, the virtual reality where the elf is a character inside this virtual reality, right? It's a virtual elf in a virtual reality. That elf can look far and wide inside that virtual reality and it won't find the computer that's computing the reality. The computer has to be in, as Fred, Dr. Fredkin said, another physicist who was an early adopter of virtual reality, it has to be in other, you know, other than within the virtual reality that's being computed. So the computer has to be in a different reality frame that is outside of the frame that the elf is in. Well, that just makes logical sense, right? The, uh, the computer has, that computes it has to be in another reality frame. Now, the player that is the elf's consciousness. You see, that's what the player is. The player in the game is the one that tells the elf what to do, to jump, to run, to fight, to turn around, to look to the right or look to the left. That is, you know, the player, the elf's consciousness. Without the player giving the elf instructions, the elf just stands there and doesn't do anything at all. So if you want, that's the elf's mind. That's the elf's um, mental capacity. That's the elf's consciousness. Now, the, the two active elements, which is, the, which is the player and the computer, they're trading data. That's really all that's going on in a virtual reality game. The player sends data to the computer, and the computer sends data back to the player. And the player sends data back to the computer, and the computer sends data back to the player. That's the only thing that's going on. And the player has to be in the same reality frame as the computer because you can't pass data back and forth directly across different reality frames. So the computer and the player must be in other, other reality frame other than the virtual reality. Now, all of that is just simple logic, right? That's not, none of this is too, too deep or hard to get. It's just very straightforward logic. So given that this is a virtual reality, that our universe, our physical universe is a virtual reality, Logic tells us that the consciousness, the player, and the computer have to be non-physical to the virtual reality. So here we are in a virtual reality, and our body is like the elf. Okay, Our consciousness is like the player. And the computer and the consciousness have to be in the same reality frame. And see, all of that has to be outside of our physical reality frame. So just a little logic will tell you that consciousness is non-physical to us, that the computer is non-physical to us. And then we look at those two and say, well, the computer, obviously, that's an information system. But what about consciousness? Well, what is it that you're conscious of? You're only conscious of the data that you receive, your sense data. You see, you hear, you smell, you feel. That's your sense data. And you take all that data away. And what's reality? Nothing. You see, you're a point of consciousness floating in the void once you take that, that away. So what is our reality? What is it we're conscious of? Information. All right. So that means consciousness is really an information system, too. It takes in information and then it interprets it to be this reality. So consciousness is an information system. The computer is an information system. And those two have to be in the same reality frame which is non-physical to our reality frame here as you know, bodies, physical beings. We're like the elf, okay? And this universe of ours is like the World of Warcraft map. It's got trees and rocks and buildings and other players in it, but it's all just virtual. It's all just computed, ones and zeros in a hard drive someplace. The real, the real actors 
are the players. You see, the, the players that are playing us, the avatars. Okay, so now just with that little bit of logic and the fact that science is pretty well coming down on the side of this is a virtual reality, then the logic tells us consciousness is non-physical. The computer is non-physical. Both of those are information systems. An information system, to be general, has to be a digital information system. And sure enough, our data we get through our senses is digital, right? It turns into to little pulses and neurons and all those discrete components, which are digital. That's what digital means, discrete. They come in little packets. It's not continuous. So we can start with physics telling us the reality is virtual, then a little bit of elementary logic telling us that consciousness is non-physical and that the larger consciousness system is the computer. You see, we've got that. Now, the one other little step we have to take is that we, the consciousness, the player, we are also just pieces of that larger consciousness system. And that larger consciousness system is a digital information system. And we as consciousness take in data and we interpret it, right? We process it. And the computer creates the virtual reality. And all that's really going on here is that you have a consciousness trading data with a computer. You see, that's the only active components of a virtual reality. And this is true of virtual reality, period. Not just World of Warcraft, but virtual reality works like that. There's just a computer, a player, and then there's the actual game that gets computed. And only the computer and the player are, are active, are doing anything. So that kind of sets the rule that science gives us just this basic idea of the nature of reality. Okay, so now we know that uh, we are consciousness. We're not in this reality frame. So we get to Marla's question, you know, what happens after we die? Well, if we're not bodies and we don't actually uh, exist in this physical virtual reality, this universe of ours, that the real uh, consciousness, the awareness, the thing that is the, the player of this, of this uh, virtual body is consciousness from another reality frame. So then what difference does it make when the body dies? Exactly the same amount of difference as it makes when your elf dies in World of Warcraft. There's no difference, you see? So what happens when your elf dies? Well, you go get another elf or you resurrect the elf that you've got. And you, you know, I think in World of Warcraft, you used to have to run to the graveyard, you know, pick up your elf and then run back to get all your, you know, weapons and all your other stuff that you had, something like that. So there's some kind of means for getting back into the game because otherwise, you see, it would just be a one shot and you're done sort of thing. Well, as it turns out, there's a purpose for all of this. There's a purpose why this virtual reality exists. There's a purpose why we are the player. And that purpose is understood by starting with a larger consciousness system. You start with this larger consciousness system and it's an information system. Well, an information system has to continually reduce entropy. And what that means, it has to always impose structure and order. Otherwise, it will dissipate. You see, if you have an information system and all the bits in it are random, then there is no information. The system's dead and it doesn't exist. There is no information system because random means no information. But if you can take those bits and construct something significant or meaningful, some kind of pattern, some kind of structure out of those bits, and as structure has significance or meaning, you've just created information. All right, well, entropy is a physics term that means a measure of disorder. So if all the bits are random, that's a lot of disorder among the bits, and there's no information. As you order those bits and make structure and, and, and uh, content out of them, you've created information, you've lowered entropy. There's more structure, more organization, you see. So that's, you know, I'm kind of defining terms. So when we use these terms later, you'll kind of have a sense of why these are actually, you know, what, what they mean and what the, what's the logic behind them. Okay. So we have this system and it has to lower its entropy or die. If it doesn't lower its entropy, naturally systems just, um, 
go to higher entropy states. Anything left alone dissipates. Anything left alone will eventually degrade. That's the second law of thermodynamics, but it's a simple idea. If you don't do maintenance to your house, eventually your house will fall down. You have to keep doing maintenance to anything that you want to maintain. And uh, even things that you think don't decay do. A battery never used eventually goes bad anyway because it just decays. And even if you had a block of iron, if you waited long enough, that block of iron would just disappear into random iron molecules, you know, around in the environment. That's called a vapor pressure. Every, everything, whether it's iron or water, little molecules are, are zipping off of it and other things are coming into it all the time. It loses molecules of itself because some of them will just get enough energy just statistically to fly off and escape the bonds of, that's keeping them there. So everything decays if you don't put maintenance into keeping it, you know, keeping it fit, keeping it useful. Same with information systems. If you don't keep trying to lower the entropy, the entropy will increase. So this larger consciousness system has a goal. That's to lower its entropy, to create information. Otherwise, it dissipates and ends up in random digits. You see, random bits. Well, how is it going to do that? Well, it needs structure. It needs organization. And it's just this one big monolithic thing. How does it get structure and organization? The same way biology figured out to do the same thing. It splits. It creates subsets of itself, gives those subsets so gives those subsets free interaction, that's called free will, and interacts with each other. Now there's a whole new range of novelty of things that could happen that couldn't happen before because you have these things that could interact with each other. So, you know, biology had to do the same thing. You had that single cell, you had the one-celled critters, and they were just kind of stuck there until they formed multi-celled critters. Multi-celled critters have lower entropy, more structure. You see, they've got more, uh, more information there. And then, the, then these multi-celled cr critters had to uh, get even more complex and lower entropy. They ended up uh, having cell specialization. So you had the, the cells that were the sensor parts, the cells that were the management parts, the cells that were the uh, digestion, and the cells that were the defense, and all these different parts of kinds of cells differentiated to specialize in a certain area, and then they all cooperated. So it's all about cooperation, which leads us to the last really logical point we need to make. A bunch of units of consciousness, which I call individuated units of consciousness, with free will, okay, constitute a social system. And it's, they, are, they are aware, pieces of awareness that interact with each other, right? They communicate with each other. That makes them a social system. They're interactive. Well, there's two fundamental ways that you can interact with each other. First is the way of love, which is cooperatively, caring. You can interact because, of, because other is important. The other is significant to you because you're all in this together. You're all interacting. It's all a big you know, interaction of things, and the cooperative way pays off. The opposite way is fear. The opposite mm. of love is fear. And if you have fear, if each one is fearful, then each one is only about themselves. You see, fear is all about you. It's not about other. It's about what can I do to ensure I survive, get the stuff I need, protect the ones that, uh, that are mine. And if somebody else has something you need and you can take it, well, you take it. If uh, you have a good idea that would maybe help a lot of people, but it works better for you and gives you an advantage, then you keep it to yourself. You see, there's no sharing. There's no trust. Um, but what happens in worlds like this where there's fear, where there's no trust? Well, eventually, because it's such a rowdy environment, you know, law of the jungle is what the, you know, the fear worlds run on. They start to group up into individual groups for defense, right? A whole bunch of these fearful beings will get together and say, well, let's, let's, uh, you know, we'll be nice to each other and we'll can defend ourselves against everybody else. Well, then other groups group up too. And then these groups can fight with each other, you know, that called war. And pretty soon you have an environment that looks just like the one we live in. <laughs> that's the, 
That's the fear grouping. Okay, it looks just like the one we live in. Okay, now what is this larger consciousness system needing to survive and lower its entropy? Then what is its goal? Its goal is to become love. Its goal is to cooperate. It's to work together. Look at biology. What did the multi-cell things do? Well, those multiple cells learn to cooperate and work together. And then when they specialize to be various you know, organs and parts of things, they learned to cooperate and work together. It wasn't all about them, but they were a part of something bigger. Well, that's us. We are these individuated units of consciousness. And our job is to learn, to grow up, to learn to become love, to cooperate. Because by doing that, we lower our individual entropy. And because we're parts of that bigger system, we lower the system's entropy. Every time we decrease entropy a little or learn a little, grow toward love, spiritual growth, however you'd like to say that, then the whole system grows with us because we're it and it's us. So now we have a purpose. So, Tom, are you, um, are you saying also that love is, if the intention is love, then it lowers the entropy and all of the molecules come together. And that's one of the reasons that I'm able to access that part of the consciousness which has survived death. Because in wanting love between, let's just say, someone here um, across from me who wants to talk to their deceased um, husband, that love, that intention creates that pathway for the cohesiveness to happen for the information. Is that another way to say it? That would be. That would be more of a poetical way to say it. It wouldn't be <laughs> the way I would say it. It's not a technical way to say it, but it is true. It's because of your caring that you are able to do what you do. If you just didn't give a damn about people, you wouldn't be doing what you do. You see, Good it's, part of your, it's, it's part of your caring. It's part of you being uh, about other and not just about yourself that you reach out, that you make these connections. If you were constantly in your mind, in your consciousness, everything was about you. How are you going to get along? How are you going to do this? How are you going to manipulate things to be the way you want them? And so on and on and on. Then you wouldn't be doing any of this stuff because the door would be shut. You see, so what you said, yes, is, is, is true, but it's not really the, the, the causality of it. It's just the fact of it, because you can't okay. get to there if you're not caring. You're not going to, to do this or do it very well. Now, you can train yourself to do some of it just by training, but you'll never be really very good at it if you, if you just train to it as opposed to it's a passion of yours. It's something, it's the way you are and you're just expressing your being and you're caring, then you could be much, much better at it. So you see, we have now a, a reason of why are we here? Well, we're here to grow up. That's why we're here. We're here to become love. We're here you know, for spiritual growth, lower entropy, however you want to, to phrase that. That's our purpose. Now, the, we also have uh, this purpose in common with the larger consciousness system. We're part of it. It needs to lower its entropy and not dissipate into random bits. So we are part of the larger consciousness system strategy to survive, to evolve, to grow. And the larger system itself is constantly evolving, just as we are. It's not a, a static system. It's a growing, evolving system. Okay, the other two pieces when we talk about uh, talking to the dead people, I have to put in is that in order to produce this virtual reality, you have to keep track of what's about to happen so you can prepare for that. And you have to keep track of what has happened because that's an important part of what you're going to do next is what you've just done. You can't do something next that's incompatible with what you've just done. In other words, you can't get to an intersection and turn right and then the next minute, find yourself, you know, two miles down the road to the left, you know, because there's a, a discontinuity in the, in the reality. So the, the past and the future have to flow into each other, I guess is what I'm saying. You can't have disconnects between them. So you need to know before the future happens, you kind of need to know what the past was so we don't have any disconnections. So we have the system has to keep track of the data. It has to know what's likely to happen. 
so it can be prepared for executing all of that. It has to know what has happened. And it collects this data such that the what's likely to happen is the is everything that might possibly happen and the probability that it will happen. That's the future probable database. Now in the history databases, it's everything that could have happened and the probability that it would have happened. And there's one little line through that big history database of all the things that could have happened, which is actually what did happen, and that's our history. You know, that's the history of our universe is all the things that did happen. But there is this bigger database. Now, when we talk about a database, we tend to think of databases like are in our computer or library books like are in our library. They're very um, kind of one-dimensional for us, right? They're descriptive is about all you get as a description. You know, here's what it was like. The sky was blue, the grass was green, you know, the person was smiling. You get all this description and you take that description and turn it into something. These databases aren't like this. We're talking about the database that's creating this virtual reality, creates our avatars. You know, it's a, it's a, um, it's a simulation that's hard for us to imagine in its breadth and depth and detail. Okay, so everything that happens is kept in this database. That means every feeling, every emotion, every thought, whether expressed or not, you know, it's not just what did they say and what did they do. That would be very one-dimensional. It's what the, how did they feel? And not only the feelings they expressed, but all the feelings they never expressed. Everything that's in there, you see, is in this database. It's the whole complete person. It's not just information about the person. It's the whole person but it is a database. So the only difference between that character when they were alive and, and making decisions and that character that's in the database that is a record of them, the only difference there is that the character that was making decisions had free will to make those decisions and the database character doesn't. They're not doing new things. They're just representing what had happened. Now, that doesn't, they're probabilistic models, though. They're not just data. So if you go in and ask Uncle Fred, who's been dead for a decade, Uncle Fred, tell me, uh, who should I vote for in the next election? Well, Uncle Fred will have an opinion. Even though he died a decade earlier, he still has an opinion because he's modeled there as everything he had ever thought did. So there's, you know, we, we have a good sense of Uncle Fred. And what would he probably have said? giving the information that is current today about the election that's going to happen next week, Uncle Fred can tell, you know, the system will tell you what Uncle Fred was likely to say. And it's going to be very, very accurate because it's not just a simple capture of Uncle Fred and data. It's everything about Uncle Fred, all of well, his secrets. What's interesting to me, Tom, um, is if Uncle Fred has something to say, one of the things that I've always uh, wondered about, especially from your perspective, is how that comes into my uh, frequency, how that comes into my realm, because I don't think that I'm open all day long to be accessing the consciousness system, or perhaps I am. It's kind of like I might be in a game, a warfare game, and I don't even know I'm in it. And Uncle Fred turns the corner and he, you know, runs into me. And all of a sudden, I feel all of and see all of uh, Uncle Fred's information, whether I necessarily want to see it or not. That's there's some element about that that I'd like for you to address. OK. And there's several reasons why that might happen. Now, normally we can get that data as we intend to get it. You know, we have an intent Thank to. You. Ask Uncle Fred a question. We have an intent to find out how, you know, where Uncle Fred hid that money that never turned up, you know, after he died. You know, did he bury it in the backyard or where? You know, we have some intention to go interact with Uncle Fred. So that's the typical thing that happens. But that's not the only way that things work. I would suspect, and you have not told me this, but I would suspect that when you just get this data, that you eventually find a use for it that you eventually find that there is a reason, there's some connection that that makes. There's somebody that you can help. There's something that you can learn. There's something that you get from that. It's not just that, hey, you know, Uncle Fred, you know, jumped, 
you know, jump two feet in the air when he was six years old and that doesn't mean anything to you or to anybody else, you don't get that kind of data. So I would, I would say that what you're going to get is going to be things that are significant to you or to somebody else. And you may not even know that somebody else yet. They may not come into your life until a year later when suddenly exactly. they're asking you questions and something in this data you got goes, oh, I see the connection. And right. it, it connects, you see. It, it, yeah. It's not that somebody came and asked you the question first. You may get the answer before the question is asked. But that's because you are known to the larger consciousness system as a conduit, as somebody who can pass important information along to other people, you see, yeah. because you pay attention, you get it. They can talk to you and you'll get it. If they talk to that other person, the other person would never know. They'd never get it because they're not open to it. It's not part of their reality. It's not something that they do. And if they actually did get the information, they'd pass it off as a daydream or just some weird thing that happened instead of actually accepting that data and holding on to it to see, well, where's this going to fit into my life? You know, where am I going to need this piece of data? But you do. So that makes you a conduit. That makes you a, val a valuable resource to the larger consciousness system because it can reach out and touch any number of people through you. And you wow. may get a piece of data. And when you get that data, the person that really needs it, that you're going to pass it on to a year from now, they may be nudged towards you. They just pick something up that has an article about you in it. They just know somebody who knows you yes. and that's a friend of theirs. And they've told their friend about this big problem they have because they and their uncle Fred had this real big fight just before he died. And they've been feeling real guilty and torn up about it. And it's just been you know, a real problem for them with all this guilt and so on. And that friend says, Oh, I know this, this, uh, this lady, Marla, and she can probably help you with that. You see, and that's why you get that data. And that person just gets nudged bumped by the system. Call that synchronicity, if you like. Things just happen that put them in touch with you. And then they say, Marla, I've got this problem, you know, with my little Fred. And you go, oh, yeah, I got that. You know, here's what's going on with you. Yeah. Because, one, you can use your intent to go get the data or you've already gotten the data. So that's what's going on. You get that information because you can make use of it, whether it's for yourself or whether it's for somebody else, or even it could be just for your own learning, just for your own understanding of a bigger picture. You know, your own growth is important as well, too. Right. So that's why that happens without you asking for it. Uh, you get that job because you can do it. You know, that's that's why you get it. You're available. You You care. If you didn't care about people, you wouldn't. That's what you started out. Well, is it because of my love and their love? And well, yes, but not directly. You know, indirectly it is because if you didn't care, you wouldn't. You wouldn't qualify for this job of passing this information along to help people resolve issues and to see bigger pictures. And sometimes it may not even be an issue. It may not be that they have an Uncle Fred that they need to deal with. It may just be opening their eyes. Just something that that makes them go, oh, wow, yeah, well, I can't explain that in any normal way. That means that reality must be bigger than just this physical world. And that may be the only point in the connection at all, just to give them a, an idea that it's a bigger reality, because that then should send them, you know, looking for more information, which is Good. the point. They'll help them grow yeah. up. So that's why these things just happen to you, even though you don't go out and seek them and you didn't seek them. It's not like you grew up and said, I want to grow up to be a medium, you know, and look exactly. to dead people. It just happened to you because you were open. <laughs> and why does it happen to you? And why does it happen more to women? We talk about mediums almost in everybody's mind. We see a lady, right? Think of a medium. And uh, we don't think of some you know, old burly guy with a beard. You know, we think of some woman is the medium. And why is that? Why is there a sexual preference here, it seems, for mediums? It's because this talent for connecting to the larger conscious system is easier for women because the connection has to occur at the being level. It can't occur at the intellectual level. It's a being level connection. And women tend to live out of their being level 
more than men do. Men tend to live out of their intellectual level more than women do. Women tend to be more, and that's why we say, oh, women are emotional. Well, emotions are at the being level, you see. That's where most women are. At Pair Labs, they found out that, you know, Pair Labs was a group of physicists uh, that worked uh, just out for Princeton. It was Princeton, Anom Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research was the name. So this was a Princeton offshoot, and they studied uh, how people could use their intents to modify random number generation, generators and generation, okay? They found out that if you ask men to buy, say, the average value of a bunch of random numbers upward or downward, the men would do upward when asked and downward when, when asked and would do it only just a little bit, though. It wasn't very strong, but it was a, a significant effect. They'd ask the ladies to do it, and they'd say, well, make the distribution go up or make it go down, and they found out that when the ladies wanted it to go up, it had about a 50-50 chance of going up or down, either one. They didn't do it the way they were intending, but the motion in what they did and what they accomplished and how far they shifted that mean was many orders of magnitude. Well, maybe that's not quite true. It was much, much larger than what the men were doing. Why? Because the intent, if it's going to modify, this is, is the intent modifying future probability. This is not the past database, but it's modifying future probability. It works the same way. It's more powerful. It has a greater effect if it comes out of the being level, not out of the intellectual level. And that's, that's why you. the ladies, that's why the ladies were, um, you know, I can't remember the numbers, but three or four times the impact than the men were. But the men always made it move the way they intended. The women, it could go up, it could go down, but it always went up or down by a whole lot, you see, compared to the men. So the women weren't as intellectually tied to the precise result as they were to a sensing, a feeling, a connection at the being level to what it was they were doing. So well, this is perfect because this builds the bridge between science and what Lori and I do. Um, because of that actual um, sex um, differentiation between women mm -hmm. and men. I find that really important, Tom. And um, Lori, I'm, I'm really feeling that you need to step in here too because you're part of this conversation now as well. So are you there, girlfriend? <laughs> this, is, this is a very, I mean, it's a big piece. It's an interesting piece. I mean, I don't want to get too much into my stuff before, you know, but I mean, it's it's all about the choices, right? It's all about the choices of how we allow information. Like I don't I learned at a very early age how to shut down because being too feeling as a small child, um, people didn't appreciate that. So I am able to shut down. I mean, I'm. I will still get information, but I don't, I don't really pick up on it unless I'm asked about it. So there's a slight difference. Um, just because I learned how to shut, I was able to, I was able to create something, and I don't even know how to, I did it, and I can't really help anybody with it either because there are a lot of people that would really like to know. But I was able to shut down so that I didn't, I didn't just get this information unless I was you know, in the place that I wanted to receive it. Um, just because it was really intrusive to know what people were feeling um, when you're a, like a young kid and they would get so upset. It's like, how do you know this? I'm like, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I just feel it. Like, I, how, do you ex how do you answer that question when you're three and four? You know, so knowing how people were feeling and knowing that they'd be upset or angry or, you know, even getting information as to why they're upset and angry. You know, kids at school, parents, you know, friends of the family, they did not want to know that. So I learned how to shut it down. So that's the sure. only difference is I just don't get that flow all the time unless sure. I'm, you know, clear and sitting in a place and without right. fear. And there's a reason for that uh, where Marla was getting specific information that she could use. You see, the system was, was using Marla as a conduit to help other people. You were getting information. You were just picking up what was there, not necessarily specific information that you were you know, wanting to put on. You were just getting whatever information just happened to be there. 
And what yeah. happens is, yes, we can tune in to every other human being on this planet. But if we tune into all seven and a half billion of them at once, it's insanity. It's just too much. <laughs> oh you God. see, you can't do that. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to be in a room of seven and a half billion people all talking at the same time. You know, there's, there's nothing you can do with that. And it becomes intrusive in your life. As you said, you understand how people are feeling. You understand what they're thinking. You understand what their motivations are. And you pretty, you, your first idea is that everybody does this. You know, you don't yeah. realize that you don't realize that you're different. You know, that everybody doesn't do this. So you kind of interact with it just like it was, you know, like any rock or tree that was out there that everybody everybody sees. And then you find out that, you know, you suddenly get pulled out for special scrutiny because you're different. And in as a little child, being different is sort of the curse of death, right? Uh, you know, once you get to be older and adult, being different is like really cool. But when you're young, being different is a problem. So you learn to control it. And some people didn't have the courage that you had and they just stuffed it under the rug and refused to ever go there again and shut it out completely. You had the courage to say, I have to control it. I can't just get everything and whatever. I have to control it to just the data I want. And that's when I want it. And then you have to go and access that data because you have an intent to access it. And that's why I started the, the conversation with Marla saying most people, are in that mode. They just get the data when they want to access it and when they put out their intent, but not everybody. Sometimes people are seen as conduits and that's part of their job is to get this data and pass it on. And it's not so much that they're <laughs> looking for it as it is, you know, it's, it's what they do. And that's just something they have to, to work with. So the two of you are very different in the way you approach it, but it's the same thing. You know, you've just, you, you just have different purposes. And, and you're, you're, it takes all kinds. It's not that uh, one's better than the other to have it one way or the other. It's just that it takes all sorts of diversity, all sorts of different people doing things from different angles and in different ways to make the big difference. Because there's some people who will, you know, will look at Marla and the way she just gets these things and think that maybe they should, uh, you know, move to the other side of the street when they see her coming because that's just so weird. And you are so some, psychic. You know, the, <laughs> there, there are some people, you know, who will react that way to her, but she has the constitution and the self-confidence to deal with that because she came through hard times that taught her to be self-resilient and have that kind of confidence, you know, sink or swim. So she learned that and she's got that and she works well in this, in this role. Um, but I, su people, I, I, I still get disappointed when I'm not invited for dinner, Tom. <laughs> yes. Well, the thing <laughs> is, there are other people, though, who seek you out, you see, because you have those abilities. They're knocking on your door. They're writing. They're sending your emails they're, They want you to to, uh, you know, help them out. And they're kind of there for everybody. She helps out the people that come to her. But it's just a different thing. It's, a, it's just like everybody looks different, you know, and everybody just interacts with this information differently. So it's I think, Laura, yours is probably more common than Marla's, but it's just different. It's not uh, better or worse or anything else. It's just different. It's just the way you two, you two work. But you didn't run away from it. You just kept it at a lower profile and you worked with it. And you worked with it enough that you began to trust it and you began to understand it. And you began to uh, come up with, uh, uh, call them rituals, but the processes that would allow you to access what you wanted to access. When you access it, you, you made your own processes, which, which are in a way rituals. They're just things you do, the processes you go through to, to make it work for you. And uh, it became a very big part of your life. And again, for the same basic reason that it became a big part of Marla's life, you care about people. You want to be helpful and you have a way to help them that they can't help themselves. You can make connections for them that they can't make. And that's important to you. So you're in it because you care. Now, if you didn't care, you could have tried to use your gift for mm -hmm. manipulating people, for, uh, you know, uh, tricking people and that kind of thing. But it had you done that, you would have gotten not better at it, but you would have gotten worse at it because the, I want to manipulate people. You see, I want to control 
that's high entropy. So that just gets in the way of your ability to do it. So if you tried to do that, you'd end up getting worse and worse at it. And the, and the, the skill or the ability would get less and less and you'd be more and more, uh, um, so we say, uh, uh, frustrated by it, and that frustration is also negative and high entropy, and you see it just kind of fizzles out. But because you did care, you worked on it because you knew that you could be helpful to people, and you wanted to be helpful to people, so you grew it and got really good at it. You see, the same reason Marla did. She got good at it because she realized this was valuable. And even though people would would uh, <laughs> would not invite her to dinner, you know, that wasn't as important to her as being as being able to help people. She knew what she was doing, and she knew it could be helpful. And if other people didn't get that, well, that was their problem. They had to deal with their own, you know, with their own uh, belief system. So, so that's kind of how it works, and why it works that way. And when you talk to a dead person, you're you're most likely. Now I say most likely. It's not necessarily certain that you're talking to this database, but you most likely are. And the reason I say that is that when people die, they don't sit on clouds practicing the harp in, in case somebody wants to talk to them. You know, says, well, I'm going to hang out here for the next uh, 100 years or so, just in case somebody wants to talk to me. You know, so they, they're not stagnant like that. They need to go on with their lives. They need to make, keep growing, keep becoming, keep uh, evolving, you see. So just sitting around to ask questions, answer questions isn't, isn't on their uh, to-do list. So no, what Tom, happen- uh, they, they often tell me what they're doing. They often tell me what other people are doing. But this brings up yeah. another great point. When you decide to reincarnate, when you decide to come back and do it all over again. So I'm not really familiar uh, exactly with the uh, terminology that you use as past life experience packets, but I'd mm-hmm. love to learn a little bit more about that. If you can share some of that. Okay, sure. Um, well, let me, I'm going to finish this one thought first, and that is sometimes you can talk directly to that free willed being. It's not necessarily that you have to be talking to a database. You can be talking to that being directly. Okay. But you're not going to do that very often because mostly those people have moved on and when they moved on they are not that person anymore once they move on okay they were Susie q who worked in a restaurant in the 1930s or something but now they're you know joe joe smith you know and they are driving a cab in in tokyo (laughs) that's different you see they're a different person with a different set of experiences and a different personality and everything's different about them Okay, so when you touch into that Susie Q, because that's the one you want to touch into, now you're going to get the database, or what you're going to get is the larger consciousness system playing Susie Q. Why? Because that would provide you with the information you need to be helpful and to, and to you know learn for yourself and help other people learn and grow. So now you've got the larger consciousness system playing Suzy Q. And the larger consciousness system can play Suzy Q really, really well because guess what? Suzy Q was just a piece of the larger consciousness system to begin with, right? So so that's the thing. So now you're you're as close to talking to Suzy Q as you could be because you've got a sentient being with uh, free will that's talking to you in the place of Suzy Q. The reason is, is because that's going to be helpful to somebody. That's going to help somebody grow up. It's going to help somebody see a bigger picture. So the larger consciousness system is going to talk to you as Susie Q. So that's the other thing it comes. So it's not always just in the database. It depends on the situation. It depends on the data you want to get. It depends on, you know, the other people involved and what they need to hear. But the larger consciousness system can play anybody very convincingly because we are just pieces of the larger consciousness system. Yeah. See, and it's got all the information and all the data. So meanwhile, you know, now this this burly guy driving a taxi in Tokyo, you see, is not really involved in it. It's not like a piece of him comes back to be Suzy Q. He's off doing the taxi driving job in Tokyo, and that's where his full attention is. Now, the, the um, what do I call it, the individuated unit of consciousness, 
okay, has all his data, and that individuated unit of con consciousness could talk with you, but probably it's just the larger consciousness system. So you see the sources of your information could one, be database, two, the larger consciousness system, or three, the individuated unit of consciousness, which Suzy Q you know, was a part of. It could be any of those three that you're talking to. Most of the time, it's the database because that's just the simplest, most straightforward. But if you need information that's beyond that being a very credible source, you'll get something different. I Another sure do, Bob. Yeah, I often get I I often get a lot of emotion, and if that is part of the larger consciousness system with all the emotion as well as the details of information, that's right. pretty incredible. I mean, right. that we have that we have that offered to us that we can access that. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. Well, all of that emotion and all of that knowledge is all part of the database. You can get that right out of the database. Every piece of emotion, and it's. It's real. I mean, that's that's this person. Their entire life is all there, all their feelings. So you do get an exact copy in the database of that person. And it, it is very difficult to know that you're in a database. It took me a lot of experiments to figure out that it was a database because I could go to that, that uh, you know, the past, if you will, and I could interact in that past. And I could make changes in that past. I can say, okay, well, instead of this, we're going to do that. Now what happens? And I could see that it would run a different way. And I would go to the past and I would make a, you know, because you can be there. You can interact with it. And there's things you can say. And then they'll react to you. And I set up situations. I did this hundreds of times because you have to do science. You have to do the experiments over and over again. And I found out that if I said exactly the same thing to exactly, in exactly the same situation to exactly the same people, I would always get exactly the same response. And that was when I first got a, oh, this is somehow, you know, this is what I've gotten a couple of times. Is there any difference here? And then I'd change it a little bit. I'd say it a little differently, but maybe within the same sort of meaning. And I'd find out that I'd get maybe a, a different response. Or if I said it with a different emotion, I'd get a different response. If I was different in any way, I'd get a different response because it was their probability interacting with me. But if I did the exact same thing the exact same way, I'd get the exact same result. In other words, the person I was talking to would say the exact same words that they did before. Now, this to do those... Like, this to sounds do like those, scary. Siri, doesn't this sound like Siri? This yeah, doesn't this sound like interacting with the computer like Siri. Yes, or, or you see, I'd like, I, so you're saying that the database is alive. I'm saying it, that the, oh yeah, the database is able to talk to you. It's able to make decisions. It's able, I mean, it's able to do a lot of things within the context of its history. You see, it's a probability model. What's the probability of this person? If I ask them a question of what do you think about so-and-so? you know, and they respond to me, it's the way that person would respond to me based on all their emotional, all their knowledge, all their experience, everything. It's a probability model, and you'll get what is the most likely response to your question. And you won't know that this is a database unless you do research like I did, which you re if you can repeat, if you can go to the exact same situation a hundred times, Exactly, without any differences, and then give it little different inputs each time and see what happens. That's how I found out it was a database because, yes, if you ask the exact same question the exact same way in the exact same situation, you'll get the exact same answer. And people aren't like that because if you went to a bunch of people and said the exact same thing a hundred times, probably 70 of them, you'd get a different result because it would depend on just what was going through their mind at the time, you know, lots of things would be in play. They'd be in flux. And it turned out they weren't. Now, if I said something different, of course, I'd get a different response back. But otherwise, up until that point, I was convinced that it was all real. It was all ongoing. It wasn't a database. I was interacting with these people because I could do very complex interactions with them. We could have all sorts of discussions about anything, past things that they did, the uh, future things that 
it doesn't matter. It was just like you were sitting there talking to these individuals, and there was no way to tell the difference other than this experimentation. And you, Marla, and probably Laurie too, can can do those same experiments. In this, and you'll find out that it's a database because a, a com, you know a database will give you the same answer each time. But unless you really do the, the research there, you'll never notice it. It's just like being there. It isn't any different than being here. You're interacting with beings in the same kind of give and take relationship that you do, you know, here when you're in that database. So it's not that it's, oh, it's just a database. You know, it's just this kind of, uh, you know, narrow idea of this person, just a caricature of the person or something. No, it is that person in every detail. It's just their probability. And you can go into that database with your intent. Instead of, instead of getting the most probable thing they would say, it's another thing you can try. Go into that, that database and say, I don't want to get a reply of the most probable thing that they would say or interact with me. I want the second most or the tenth most probable thing that they would say. And then start your conversation with that intent, and you'll see they'll respond to you differently. Because now you're getting not what was most likely that person to say, given that question. You're getting what was the tenth most likely thing for them to say, given that question. It's all in there because they, they in terms of probability, are captured in this database. So that's another thing you can do with it. That's one of the reasons that you can do what-if analysis in this database. You can go there and change things, change what you say and how you interact. And those changes will play themselves out all the way through because what they're doing is, all right, I've changed this. If I change this, um, let's say uh, we, can, we can do so. Here's one I did just, just for fun because I was curious. I went back to uh, end of, toward the end of World War II. What would it be like had Hitler won that war and the Allies had lost it? Okay, what would it be like? So I started back or toward the end of that war, and I said, let's, let's make that different. You know, this battle would have gone the opposite way or whatever, and it would have turned the tide the other way. And then you can, you can work through the probabilities, and it's just like being not watching a movie, but being in the movie. You know, you're part of it. And you can go through it and see all the other things that would have happened, probably. Now, that, that doesn't mean they would have had to have happened. It's not deterministic, but they were what would probably have happened, you see? And you can run through that and you can see that, all right, I want to see it. You can tell the, the system, I'd like to see it uh, 10 years later. So instead of 1945, let's jump to 1955. Now I want to see it in 1980. I want to see it in the year 2030. Okay, it doesn't matter. And you will get what is probable, had the Germans won that war, what is probable that would be around in 2030. And it's all probability. So when you realize that you can do this in the databases, then you understand it's a database. I'm querying a database, and it's my intent is setting the query. And if your intent is to have that person act as natural, you know, that's, their, that's the most likely thing that they would respond with. That's what you get. So play around with it. And I think you'll find this database has a lot of flexibility that you've probably never used because you've only okay. thought of it as interacting with these people you know so Got that's it. yeah that's kind of a neat thing a neat thing to do besides the what if analysis is really neat you know you can go back yeah. and say well what if i hadn't forgotten my anniversary five years in a row you know uh you know would i still be married to that lady you know you can <laughs> you can ask things like that and it'll it'll tell you you know you can see that probability play out and it, again it's like you're in the movie talking to people it's not, good well uh, you know I'm, this is great because i'm getting ready to go back to, to to tmi to the monroe institute and go out to those levels where we are interacting with other consciousness um mm -hmm. out in the frequencies that we are uh referring to as other entities or other consciousness so other other than the the database of people that you know a human database i'm going into another database in a couple of months so i will be looking forward to talking to you about this later okay yeah one thing to be clear on though is your intent 
You see, you don't necessarily think about your intent when you're going out to, to find Uncle Fred, who's been done, dead for a decade. But right. your unspoken, your unspoken intent is you want to connect with that Uncle Fred that mm-hmm. that was in this reality with, you know, Aunt Jane at such and such a time. Your intent's there, even if it's not specified. Well, if your intent is fuzzy and you just thought, "I want to go see Uncle Fred," you may get into the outside of the history thread. You may talk to Uncle Fred in a probable history, but not the history that actually took place. But you oh. wouldn't notice the difference, you see. It could be something totally different. And then you come back and the stuff just wouldn't fit, you know, and it wouldn't make any sense because you didn't have a clear intent. Well, one Got of the it. reasons you're successful is because you just normally know what you're doing and, and where you're going with it. And your intent is pretty clear, even if it's not expressed intellectually. But that's something. If you're gonna if you're going to work with your with your intellect more, like when you go to Monroe and you're gonna try this and that and other things, then be very clear on what your intent is. Exactly what information are you trying to get? Because you can end up in probable realities that were never actually, you know, never actually happened. They're just probable <laughs> realities. And it's the same thing with the future. If you're gonna go look and see what's in the future, there's all sorts of probable futures there. And if you aren't real clear with your intent, you'll get into one of them that is very unlikely. Oh, yeah, you got the data all right. Yeah, you went through the process. Yes, you got the data, but it's not necessarily the data you think it is because your intent wasn't perfectly clear. So that's the only thing. You have to make sure your intent's very, very clear. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Thank you very much. Lori, would you like to ask your questions and present uh some of your things that you would like Tom to answer for you. Um, I always love your quote from the interviews you've done with Tom that you always come back to love. Um, that's really nice. I'd like, I have a question. I'd like to know what love is in terms of science. And from there on, Laurie, take it over, please. Well, I, I think that would be you, definitely. <laughs> Tom. <laughs> The short answer is that love is the nature of a low entropy consciousness. So that defines love in a technical definition in terms of entropy. Love is always about other. You see, it's, if, if, if it's about somebody else, if it's about other, then that can be love. If it's always about yourself, then that's about ego. It's about what about me? You see, so that's one way you can tell the difference. But what is love? It's it's a focus on other. It's a caring for other. It's about other. Other is is what you're is what you're uh, you know, is what you're focused on. So a low entropy consciousness is love. Take it away, Lori. <laughs> okay, so I guess. My most of my work is around keeping people clear. So intention, motivation, motivation's big, intention's really big, um, keeping people clear. So whether it's their energy that needs to be cleared from other people or it's often me just giving people space so that they have a safe place to sort of chat and talk so that we can figure out what's keeping them from everything that they desire. My cat has decided he wants to join. Um, There he is. (laughs) Um, But, you know, mostly it's, you know, helping people make better choices, helping people um, understand, you know, some of the choices that they're making or, you know, whether they're I mean, mostly it's always about whether you're in fear or love. This is why I love Tom's work. This is one of the things. I mean, I quote Tom all the time <laughs> just because I I think we have a special connection and I love the way that you can make that bridge from, you know, a place that's a little woo-woo to um, something, you know, with, with scientific background. And that's why I love being able to quote Tom and I love doing our shows which we haven't done in a while, and Tom has promised that he'll start again. And, <laughs> um, but I mean, mostly it's helping people make better choices. It's it's you know helping them see their intention, helping them understand their motivation, and helping them make choices so that they can grow towards um, love. 
And I know Donna had mentioned something about past lives. It was a question. Um, you know, it's the same as with Marla. I mean, we all have these gifts. And like Marla, I don't, I don't actually call myself a psychic. That's why my site is Intuitive Soul, because I think people relate more to intuition than they do psychic. They think psychic is an ability that, you know, only special people have. Where intuition, most people understand that intuition, everybody has. We all develop it in different ways. We all have special gifts that are unique to our own self, whether it's, you know, an auditory thing, a feeling thing, a visual thing, um, whether it's, you know, emotional, mental, physical. I mean, we all have our unique gifts, and it's learning how to use that intuition. Obviously, my preference would be to assist people to be able to use their own intuition for themselves. But I don't know about you, Marla, but... I do know that a lot of people that I'm in that I work with and even sometimes myself, you know, getting information for ourselves is not always the easiest thing. That's why we're here, that's why we're available to people and you know, sometimes past life stuff, sometimes even speaking with the dead, it's a distraction and it doesn't always help us move towards love. Sometimes it helps them keep in fear which means helps them keep stuck, which means they can't forgive, they can't let go, and they're not in a place of gratitude. And, and so my intention always is to help these people get as clear as possible. So it may be energy work that I have to do. It may be just me sitting and holding space for them so that they can talk. But it's always helping them see where they're, they have this false story of themselves this story of me that we like to sort of identify with versus, you know, our true essence and how we can always move towards love. But sometimes, you know, these filters, people don't understand that they're in and they get so confused and we're such a victim mentality society that we really like to hold on to these stories of how we've been victimized or how we've been betrayed. And, you know, I'm just as... <laughs> I've done it just as much as anybody else. It's just that now I've been learning how to stay more present and how to let go of some of these, these identities or these stories. But what I love about Tom is how he can make that bridge so that if I can't help somebody that has more of a scientific mind because I'm not a scientist, um, I can use a lot of Tom's words to assist me to help them. So I'm not sure if there's a question there, but any, I mean, it's just really about helping people understand that this isn't just woo-woo stuff, that everybody has these abilities, but that we can learn how to use them not as a distraction. I mean, I have lots of tools that I use, but only because I find them more uh, or less invasive than others. And, and I think that's part of what we talked about earlier is how I kind of learned how to, I don't know if I've controlled it, but I've certainly learned how to, it's almost like I, I think I have a belief that unless somebody is ready to hear the answer, so therefore they have the question, unless somebody is actually ready to hear it, I, I don't hear it for them. So that's probably a belief that I hold, which may restrict, you know, more information from coming um, like you do, Marla. But anyway. One Oh, I, I have, I have strong, I have, excuse me, I have strong boundaries around those things. I, I don't go where I'm not invited, but it doesn't mean that I can't, yeah, I do have an issue sometimes with having to shut it down. So I'm very careful about that, but I am not going to get in your face if I have some information for you without your permission. So you and I do I'm share sorry, that. I didn't mean that yet. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. One of the things you said that was very key is that you try to make give people a safe place because the problems that people are having are is fear that's their problem and you can't get rid of fear if you're fearful so the way you can let get a get let go of fear is to have a safe place where you can take that risk to deal with that fear and if you can provide them with that kind of sense of safety and security uh you know, the things they tell you, you know, you're not going to, you know, publish on your website, you know, that's private, that you're looking after them and they trust you. They have to trust you and know that you are sincere and then they can begin to let go of the fear just a little bit. 
But if they're not ready to let go of the fear, trying to pry that fear loose from them only makes them more fearful. So there's just no point in trying to force somebody, you know, to let go of their fear or see a bigger picture or realize that love is the answer, uh, that they are their own worst enemy, that it's all of this fear and, and junk they're carrying around with them is why they're so miserable. And you can't, you can't communicate that to someone unless they're really ready to get it. They're really ready to see it. And the, oh, yeah. about the only thing you can do is give them an environment where they're more ready to see it. And if you can create that environment for them, then you have a much better chance of actually doing some good for them. But some people you just can't help because they're not ready to be, they're not ready to be helped yet. And I know Marla as well. There's some people that you have something that would really be helpful to them, but after you've given people things they're not ready for a few times, you realize that's not a good idea. It's better just to keep that information to yourself because it's going to do more harm than good. You know, so you just don't go there. So it has a lot to do with the people that come to you. But of course, people won't come to you unless they are asking for help, unless they're at least to the point that they know they need help. But sometimes they still won't see that they are the problem, that it's not something oh. you're going to do for them. It's that you're going to help them do it for themselves. You know, that's, that's key. But sometimes they want you to fix it for them. And of course, you can't do that. They have to fix their problems for themselves. But you can give them information that they can use, or you can give them support or, or uh, you know, encouragement. There's a lot of things you can give them. You can even just give them, I understand your problem. That can be a big, you know, that can be a big thing all by itself, you know, which is just, uh, you know, just being there for somebody to talk to. I, I read mm -hmm. some time ago that um, when they did a, a, a study of the uh, value of psychiatry uh, relative to the value of having just a good friend to talk to, that it was really hard to see much difference. So if you just have somebody who will listen, sometimes is, is, is as much, if not better therapy than having somebody who's actively trying to fix you. And I, you know, I try to make sure that they know that it's not something, I'm not here to fix you. <laughs> like, right. I can't fix you, right? I can't fix you. You have to, you know, if, if you want changes in your life, if you want to, you know, have that steady movement forward, it, it has to do with your choices and your motivation and your intention. And it, it does, and, and I've learned all this from you, Tom. So, I mean, it's, you know, your work has been, you know, instrumental in, in assisting me to be able to be better at what I do. Well, all I do is give you words and concepts in which you can put these things into some kind of context that you can use. You know, that's, that's the only thing I bring to the table is, is that I can produce a context that you can that, you know, we need language to think. If we don't have words and we can't, you know, put words to, to our feelings, then we can't really even think about them. We can feel them, but we can't think about them. We can't process them. We can't understand them. We don't, we don't know how to work with them or change them or do anything about them until we can put it into some language as to what's the problem and what can we do about it, you know, and that requires words and language because we think in terms of language. And if you don't have the language to, to put it into words, then you're kind of stuck with a feeling that you don't know what to do with. So that's the, you know, that's kind of what I guess bring to the table for some people is that I give them a, a language at which everything then makes sense. Oh, I get it. You know, all the, all the pieces kind of drop into all the puzzle pieces kind of fit together and you see how everything's connected because basically it's, it's a language problem that, that keeps you from, Seeing a language problem creates a thinking problem. And without the ability to, to think at all, we can't process data, which makes it hard to learn. All we do is just keep on feeling without ever growing out of the, out of the experience. So I'm glad I was able to, to help some. Oh, you have. I mean, because you make it, I mean, as much as you can bring science into this and you can talk for a long time, it always comes back, which is why I mentioned that to Donna. I mean, it always comes back to love because ultimately that's what we're moving towards. And that's yes. how the choices that we get to make. And helping people see, you know, that these 
that they may have beliefs or filters from their experiences or just this story that they like to just hold on to so strongly of, you know, I was abandoned and I was betrayed and all of these stories that sort of keep them, what well, keeps yeah. them stuck. It stops uh, them. Yeah, they define themselves in terms of those stories. And if they let go of the story, they wouldn't know who they were. That's even well, scarier. That's, you see? that's the that's the un, yeah, that's the unknown, you know, and they're afraid of the unknown. So if they let go of of their story, they let go of their identity. They let go of their identity. Well, that's just too scary to contemplate because you know who would I be if I let go of my identity? And that's why they cling to the fear. You'd think that once they understand that it's fear is the problem, they say, "Oh, I'd be better off with that," and just drop the fear. But it's hard to drop a fear because that fear is part of who you are. And if that's a main part of who you are, then you're just dropping a main part of who you are. And that's another fear, a fear of the unknown. Who would I be if I wasn't this? If I wasn't this person who was neglected and beaten and whatever, if I wasn't that, who would I be? Well, you know. and that's why Marla's work is so important, because she can actually talk to those people from that perspective. And um, when she talks to them from that perspective, she was able to um, help them see that what they did or what their intention or what their motivation is was not what they were believing. I mean, that's kind of a key, um, kind of a key understanding that Marla is able to give to people is that they can see that other perspective because we all know that our communication is so um, – it's so off because it's it's based on our own perceptions of what's going on instead of what's really the truth of what's happening. And yes. truth is not black and white and truth is not, you know, right and wrong. It's, you know, if you could understand what that other person was thinking at the time or why they were doing it, then it's brilliant to help them um, be able to move past it, then they can forgive the person because then they can find out that this big fight that they were in, that they were never able to forgive their parents for, who've now passed and they're ne therefore not able to get any sort of resolution, Marla's able to actually pull that information in, help them see the other perspective because they would not have seen that perspective so that it could actually heal it. You know what? That's a really good point, uh, Lori. Um, part of the work that happens in these sessions is actually people who have made perpetrations that want to make some sort of restitution. Now, whether that's my connection to the love source or I open up that space for that to happen, but I am accessing something probable uh, in the database from a perpetrator who has come to some sort of understanding about what they have done. And, you know, I try not to keep it in the, um, the, uh, the dogma of an, an any kind of religious aspect, but there is some element of karma here going on. And I don't know if Tom wants to, to look at this right now, but there is something that I see with that database where they have, checked into their behavior or what they did in that database and there's something that changes and I've sometimes it's actually accessing that it actually happened with my mother um, and uh, being able to uh, after years of her being deceased and I had done all the work that I thought I had done about the forgiveness but um, I was encouraged to communicate with her again. And I invited one of my students who has this, you know, this accessibility to go in and, and communicate with my mother. 180 degree difference from how she was in, in life, which was shocking because it took about 10 years of death in order for that to actually happen. But that was pretty remarkable. And the ripple effects that that has in families, it's, um, I'm, I'm shocked about the ripple effects too, Tom, and, and Lori, and Donna. <laughs> yeah. You know, there's, yeah. another, there's another point that I, that I didn't bring out that maybe I should, uh, another perspective here. I did say that the larger consciousness system may be playing a character. And the reason that they would play that character is to, provide some sort of value to both you as the medium and to the person that you're working with. And 
what they would tell you or that person that they're working with may not necessarily be what that character would say or feel, <laughs> but they're telling you what it, what would be healing. They're yes. telling you what would help the person to heal, what would help the person to relax and let go and let go of the fear. So you're not necessarily always getting what you think you're getting. The larger consciousness system wants people to grow up. It wants people to let go of the fear. You know, their success is its success. So you will sometimes just get information because that's the information that your client really needs to hear for them to get over it and to go on and that sort of thing. And that's what they're told because that enables them then to let go of a burden that they're carrying. That doesn't necessarily mean that that person that's being impersonated actually feels that way, has changed or anything else. Sometimes it's just the system trying to help people grow up. So you might think of that and you say it's a fib, you know, the system's lying to us. Well, the system may do whatever it thinks is best to help people become love, to lower their entropy. And if that is a block that they can't get over, then the system may just give them information that helps them get over it and has really nothing to do with the way it is. That's the same thing with our, with our guides. You know, people have guides, that people that they, individuals that they talk to. Well, what a guide is, it's just your own personal interface with the larger conscious system. You're talking to the larger conscious system and you get your own personal interface, you know, your own personal, what they call it now, skin. You know, it's the, it's the way it looks to you. It looks like it's a, you know, male or female of about this age and, and, and you get some background on them and so on. And that's my guide. Well, that's your personal interface to the larger conscious system. And you will get information there that is helpful to you. And it doesn't have to have any other reason behind that information other than is it's helpful to you. It's helpful to you and to what you're trying to do in the world and the people you're working with and your clients or whatever. So the larger consciousness system wants to help people grow up because if you stay in fear, then you are de-evolving the quality of your consciousness. If you can let go of that fear, you're evolving the quality of your consciousness. And that's the whole point of us being in this virtual reality. This virtual reality is a schoolhouse. It's a, it's a um, you know, entropy reduction trainer, if you will. You know, like uh, <laughs> pilots learn to be pilots in, in, in uh, flight trainers, right? They put them in a flight trainer with all the controls. Looks just like a, B, you know, a Boeing uh, 747. And they got all the same knobs and dials and everything. It's just a simulation, though, on their, on their windshields, just a simulation. They do that because they don't want to put novices in charge of, you know, of a billion dollar airplane and then turn all the engines off and say, well, what are you going to do now? You know, well, that's too risky. You might kill somebody and blow up an airplane. So they put them in trainers and let all the engines go out and say, well, what are you going to do now? Well, they got to flip switches and pull things and say stuff and they got to do it fast. They have to they can't think about it. They have to really react. All that's learned in trainers flight trainers. Well, this is an entropy reduction trainer that we're in called this physical universe. And we're here to learn to become love and grow up. And the system will help us as it can. If what we need, if we've got this, this myopic uh, tunnel vision that what we think is, is the only thing uh, that's important is this physical reality. Physical reality is all the reality there is. There's nothing else. So leave me alone. You know, that kind of an attitude. Then those are the people if they have any openness at all, that will have some paranormal event happen right in front of their eyes that kind of blows them away. And suddenly it's an, oh my God, you know, uh, how could that happen? And that's a wake up call. And the only reason that paranormal event happened to them was they needed a wake up call and they were able to use it. Now, if they were so focused in the material that even if they got a wake up call, all they do is deny it and go on then they generally don't get that kind of thing. The synchronicity doesn't work to, you know, put in front of them what they need to see. It just doesn't happen because they're not ready to deal with it. But as people become, the doors open maybe just a crack, 
Well, then these things will happen, and the larger conscious system just provides that synchronicity. You know, a, a book will jump off the shelf into their hands that, yeah. you know, is just yeah. what it is they need to read, you know, when they yeah. walk through the library, you know. This kind of stuff happens, and uh, they just meet the right person who says the right things and gets them going to meditation classes or something. It changes their life. Well, these are people who need a little nudge, and the system gives them nudges. So that's good news in that the system is working for our success. And it will tell you things, posing as other people, to help that happen, or it will provide, uh, you know, uh, synchronicity to help that happen. So the point is, you never really know what you're doing. When you get information, all you can say is, I'm getting this information, I'll pass it on, it's useful information, and worrying about the source or the rest of it is really not that important. What's important is, is the information useful? Can people really learn and get something from it? If they can, it doesn't matter what the source is. It doesn't matter whether you've touched into their higher self, whether it's, uh, you know, their Uncle Fred, whether it's a larger consciousness system or anything else. What matters is, does it help these people? And then the source isn't that important, so you don't worry about it. You just do your thing. You act as the conduit. You know, you do the larger conscious system work, and you pass it along, and you don't really have to explain to anybody. You know, you, you can just, you know, tell them what it is that they can relate to. You know, you're extracting data from the larger consciousness system. You see, that sounds very technical. You know, well. if, that's what, if, if that's what they relate to, then that's what you tell them. You people know, usually, uh, people, Tom, people usually relate to the word God. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, we're bridging. I, it's important for me to extrapolate on any uh, organized belief system so that we understand beliefs. I, I have to say something about this, if you don't mind. I was looking through your book this morning, and I have to quote you, if you don't mind. Um, do you mind? <laughs> Oh, I don't mind. No. <laughs> okay. Well, it's actually page 162, and you say your beliefs, cultural, religious, personal, or scientific, are for the most part not relevant to the quality of your consciousness, except that they may retard it by limiting what your mind can think. And there's a lot more here, but I just wanted to mention that. Um, it's it's tricky in this world, in this uh, Judeo-Christian culture that we have in the United States or around the, the globe. And I, and I do want to bridge this. And I do want people to understand that um, we can devoid any kind of divisiveness by referring to it as the larger consciousness system, the universe, the source, the force, God. But um, as, as you, as we all know, who have studied your work, it's incredibly helpful. And um, I forgot how witty you were when I was reading some of this this morning. Very well, I pro cheeky. I probably wasn't so witty when you read it the first time. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you're probably right. It's my reality now that you're very witty. <laughs> Yeah, I know a lot of times people will tell me on a second and third and, and one person, even as far as a seventh reading, said that somehow I was changing the text because they would swear that some of the stuff they read on, the, on that, that seventh read they had never seen before. <laughs> I, I got that, yeah. <laughs> that is true. <laughs> well, well, that's I just the same language, though, that we all sort of get caught up in is that we could – you know, as Marla, you know, a client could ask her to speak with the same person over and over again and get completely different information or come to see me and, you know, I'll feel it. It's like when we're ready, then we get to see the other parts of the information that was already there. And we don't yeah. see it until we're ready. We don't hear it and we don't feel it until we're ready. Yeah. And what's important is, is that information helpful? Exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's what's important about it. Is that information helpful? And rather than somebody doing a study that takes your information and Marla's information and shows that they're not exactly the same, therefore it must be bogus. You know, they just don't understand what's going on. And it's it's not like that at all. You know, that that sort of study is just ridiculous. You know, it means nothing. Everybody gets things in their own way. And we get data and we have to interpret it. And we interpret the data based on 
what's inside of us, our history, our experience, our beliefs, our fears, all of that stuff goes into our interpretation. And after we interpret it, then we have to put it in words, which again are limiting, you know, the words, the concepts that we know, that we have, that we can put it into, and then we give it to another person. And that other person hears our words, and they have to interpret those words in terms of their history, their fear, their, you know, their uh, biases and their, their, you know, their knowledge and their emotions, everything else. So you can see every story changes. You know, every time you, every time you pass it to somebody else, you know, the story gets changed a little bit. So the fact that two people would get very similar data and say very different things in different ways, that's just the way reality works. You know, it's supposed to be that way. The fact that you and you and Marla wouldn't get the, the same words and pass the same message along is not, you know, it doesn't say anything about, you know, what's going on here. You know, that's, but people have this idea that the non-physical is just like the physical, only not here. You know, it's not just like the physical. In the non-physical, we talk in terms of paragraphs. We don't necessarily get linear lines of speech. I mean, sometimes you can, but mostly you get ideas, you get concepts, you get feelings, you get a paragraph at a time, not a not a, a string of letters, you know, and then you have to interpret those and you interpret them in terms of metaphors and you pick metaphors that you think will be meaningful to your client because you're trying to communicate to a client and you have to use the metaphors that your client understands, you know, so it's it's all very personal. We live in a, not in an objective reality. We live in a subjective reality. There really is nothing that's objective in this reality. Even the things that science calls objective, they call them objective because they are, um, they have low amounts of uncertainty with those things, with those measurements. They have just small uncertainties. They're not really objective, but they're approximately objective. So we call it objective, but nothing's really objective. And when you get to the world of concepts and ideas and consciousness, nothing is even close to objective. It's, it's subjective space. And what we get has something to do with who we are and with who our client is and with what's going to do who good, you know, and it may be that you will learn something your client won't, you know, your client may learn, learn something and you don't. It's, you know, that's the way it is in a subjective world. And when people try to nail it down and make it objective, they're just trying to, you know, they're pushing on a rope. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, buy them anything. Matter of fact, it just confuses everybody more because you can't force an, a, a subjective reality to be objective. And isn't that the case with science? Because science is always, it wants proof and yet they don't speak this language. Yeah, scientists have this thing. Uh, well, you know, actually, scientists don't want proof. The people who are really not scientists, they use the word proof more than scientists do. A long time back, scientists talked about proof, and that's when we had Newton's laws. You see, these were physical laws that must be obeyed. And science doesn't really think like that anymore because every time they came up with a law, you know, so many years later, they found out it really wasn't a law after all. It wasn't even right. You know, so they gave up with laws. Now we talk about theories. So we have the theory of, you know, relativity and the theory of quantum mechanics and uh, evolutionary theory. And everything's a theory because we realize there are, there is no proof of anything. I mean, none of us could prove who our parents were. We could maybe go back and look at the uh, birth records, right? But we couldn't prove it. How do we know that babies weren't switched by a couple of nurses who got confused? Uh, we don't, you know, there's no way to prove anything. So there really is no proof. Uh, Dean Radin has a phrase that he, I've heard him say, and he says, proof is for whiskey. Science <laughs> wants evidence, not oh, proof. Whoa. I love that. Yeah. Proof for whiskey. So science, real science wants evidence. So we have a theory of relativity and that's based on certain evidence. And we have, you know, a theory of, anything else, quantum mechanics or, or evolution or anything, and it's based on evidence, there is no such thing as proof because that's the nature of our reality. 
And the reason that it's not that important to try to find the source of the data, but just deal with the data, is that we never actually get to see the source. All we get is the data. And then we interpret that data, and we may give that data a source, but that's us giving that data a source. It's just information. Larger conscious system, some individuated unit of consciousness, some, you know, evil three-horned monster from the, you know, from the, the far beyond or something. Who knows? You see, that's not important. Deal with the data because the source is unknown. In other words, the source of the data, we never get to touch directly. It's always indirectly. All we ever can get as consciousness is data because that's what information systems do. They pass data around. So we can, we can get the data, but we never actually get a direct look at, touch, or measure of the source of the data. So we have to realize that since we don't actually get the source of the data, that we attribute that source. We, we make in our minds what we think that source is. And that's just a model. It's not a fact. So all the times, all the data we get, it's just a, it's just a model of what we think that data is. So it's the same with, with, my, uh, you know, with, with my big toe. My big toe is a model. It's not, you know, it's, it's not uh, the truth, you know, with capital letters. It's just a model. It's a way of looking at reality that makes sense. It's a way of looking at reality that answers a whole lot of questions, both subjective as well as objective ones. You know, it does good quantum mechanics. It does good relativity, does good physics. And it also explains why the Buddha said that, uh, you know, this was all illusion. So it's, you know, we have to stop putting a lot of credence in the, I'll believe it because of the source. The source really isn't the key. Is that it's not, should you believe it or not? No, you should never believe anything. You should be open-minded and you should be skeptical. And the thing you want to ask is, is this information useful? Can I learn from this? Will this help me grow up? You know, will this help somebody else grow up? And if the answer is yes, we really don't care what the source is. Is it the larger conscious system playing a role? Is it this being, you know, am I making it up? Is it, uh, you know, whatever? Makes no difference. You know, it just doesn't matter. So trying to say, well, you're not for real because, you know, we don't know who your source is or that source is make believe. Well, the source is really irrelevant. Doesn't matter who the source is. What matters is, is the, is the information useful? And you see, that's why you ladies are so good at what you do is because it matters to you most of all that the information is useful. You're not really struggling over sources and things. You really want to help somebody. And because of that, you make good, you know, you do well with the kind of work that you do because your heart's in the right place and it's about caring. It's about love and that's helping people grow up. And we can call that spiritual growth or just growing up or, you know, lowering the entropy of your consciousness or consciousness quality or whatever, but it's all the same thing. And that's what we're here for. That's our job. And you know, that's that's the reason why these things happen. That's the reason, Marla, that you get these these things. It's because you care and you're going to help somebody with them. If you weren't going to help somebody with them, you wouldn't be getting them. You see, and the source, again, is irrelevant, really doesn't matter. But the source has to be useful. And without the emotion, without the all of that, you know, realness to it, it couldn't be very helpful for you. You can't just, you know, quote a line out of a book and somebody will say, oh, wow, that really helps. You see, we don't, we don't take information through the intellect like that and process it well. We need to take the information in at the being level, which is an emotional level. So you have to get all the emotional content and all that connection. It has to be real live stuff there. Otherwise, it's not going to be very helpful because we don't learn through our intellects as much as we learn through our being level. That's where we're really connected. That's who we are at the core. And that's where it has to come from. So it doesn't matter. The source thing is a, is a red herring. It's just not significant. Exactly. Who is that I'm talking to? <laughs> uh, wrong question. Answer is, is that information valuable to me? Uh, right question. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you, Tom and Marla and Lori. I hope this has been helpful to everyone. 
Um, did anything, anyone have anything else to add or any other, any other questions? More to come. Okay. I, I, this would be great to do it again. Thank you all so much.